industry. We're excited that so many people have joined from different parts of the country. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it's great to see Scott, Brianna, and Shaniqua, who we were originally scheduled um, to head off to Austin in early March. And then, of course, the COVID crisis hit. And um, that's obviously no surprise to anybody, and, not, and, and much has changed since then. It feels like a particularly good time to discuss um, civic education, how that relates to civic engagement, and how we can ensure that our, as citizens, we understand what we need to do, when, especially when our government um, doesn't function the way we want it to. So this, this feels like an excellent time uh, to start that discussion. Um, before I get go any further, I just want to um, bring in this illustrious panel, um, starting off with Brianna Carmen, who is the Director of Organizing and Partnerships for Voto Latino. And um, Brianna, I think you were born in El Paso, Texas, but, she, but particularly impressive, she was one of the youngest Hispanic women to run a congressional campaign at the tender age of 21. Um, she has worked tirelessly as an organizer and mostly with Voto Latino. And um, anyway, I just wanted to invite you into that discussion. Um, hey, hey. Uh, Shaniqua McClendon is our next panelist. She's a political director at Crooked Media. Uh, she also has been working in politics mostly for the past decade. She was um, an intern in the Obama White House and now she's the political director, as I said, for Crooked Media, where among her many responsibilities, she is managing uh, that platform on the site called Vote Save America. So she's deeply engaged in also this topic. And then finally, we have Scott Warren, who is the CEO of Generation Citizen. And Scott's Scott founded this um, organization while he was at Brown University. He's deeply engaged in um, the idea of civic education. He's been working on this for the better, also the better part of a decade. Um, has numerous um, engagements in civic action and engagement and is widely published. Uh, so uh, also, very excited to have you all. And Generation Citizen is actually sponsoring this panel in partnership with iCivics. Um, I'm Jyoti Sarda. I'll be your moderator for this hour. Um, I hail actually from a studio marketing and distribution background, but I'm currently the producer of a documentary series called And She Could Be Next, which uh, follows a number of defiant women uh, kind of reclaiming democracy, if you will, by um, running for office and by organizing uh, an electorate that isn't often um, uh, addressed. And so those, we followed Stacey Abrams, Lucy McBath, Rashida Tlaib, and um, uh, Maria Elena Durazo out of California, and um, Bushra Amiwala and Veronica Escobar. So anyway, that's, that's how I'm entering this conversation. We're really interested in having kind of a a broad, definitely an academic discussion, but also really trying to understand how education works, uh, you know, beyond the classroom. And so let me just kind of set it up a little bit and then we'll, we'll dive in. I wanted to say that please feel free to drop in any questions that you may have or comments into the chat. Um, we're gonna have a couple, we'll definitely have a Q&A at the end. And then at the very end of the hour, if those of you who wish to kind of participate in some breakout groups, we will have an opportunity for an extra half hour session where we'll put you know, those remaining uh, participants into more intimate discussion groups. So that's our, our plan. Um, you know, it's interesting when you think about civic education, it is, there's definitely a correlation between civic education and civic engagement. And um, so it shouldn't come as a surprise if you think that civic education is actually in a state of crisis. And this isn't new, it's been that way for a while. Um, 
this isn't a K through 12 issue. It's actually an adult literacy issue as well. Um, here's just a couple of stats that might you might, sorry, you know, I just did something. I apologize. I was supposed to, uh, I can't do it, but I was supposed to share this slide as I was introducing people. Apologies, but c'est la vie. Okay. See everybody's beautiful faces? We're going to move past that. So anyway, uh, so often students and adults struggle to represent, you know, remember their own elected representatives, how representative democracy works, let alone compare it to how other systems of government work. So when we're talking about really weighty issues, I think that the citizens, we all believe the citizenry isn't necessarily equipped to actually engage in that. Um, a couple of stats, you know, um, there are uh, fewer than uh, one in three schools actually offer dedicated civic education courses. Um, and, and a lot of times school leaders feel pressured to focus on other topics besides that really get to the idea of standardized tests in many communities. Um, according to an American Council report, less than 20% of liberal arts colleges and universities require students to take even one history, American history or government course be before graduation. So that's that's um you know primary education and then it it actually doesn't get much better when it comes you know as 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 students progress into college for those who do progress into the college and then of course there's an issue of you know sort of adult literacy and how much do you even retain of, of what you did pick up so i don't know did you already uh launch the first survey or should i read the question And no, I haven't launched it. Happy to do so, Jyoti. Oh, yeah, let's do uh, it right all now, ready. just for fun. And, and as we start our panel discussion, um, I wanted to ask what, if anybody want, cares to guess, what percentage of adults can name all three branches of government? And there's a couple of different options. Feel free to just, you know, guess whether it's 10%, 50%, 25%, or 40%. Um, and as people are taking that, uh, quiz. I'm actually going to now turn it over and, and start chatting with uh, the panelists. And, and what I'd love to do, just starting with Brianna, then Shaniqua, and then Scott, is if, if each of you could actually share what civic education sort of means to you, because I think that it might mean different things to different people. Sure. So hi, everyone. Brianna Carmen from Voto Latino. Really excited to join y'all online from the comfort of our homes or wherever you guys might be tuning in. Um, when I think about civic education, civic engagement, right, it seems like an umbrella term where it seems all encompassing, everything can fit into it. But with that in mind, what does it really mean? So, you know, civic engagement, civic education, in my opinion and how I use it in my work is just an understanding of the framework of how to participate in our democracy and then being able to use that framework and take action in meaningful ways as part of your democracy, whether that be volunteering, whether that be voting, whether that be running for office, you know, a bunch of different things. So it's definitely a broad term in my opinion. Yeah. Excuse me. Hi, everyone. Um, again, I'm Shaniqua McClendon um, and work at Crooked Media. And um, just for those who may be unfamiliar with it, it's a progressive media company that was founded by three former Obama staffers. Uh, and, you know, I think this ties into kind of what I think civic engagement is. But when they founded the company, a big part of the reason they founded it was tons of news out there. You can pretty much consume news anywhere, but it was a lot of bad news. And no one ever told people how they could actually fix a lot of the problems that they were seeing in the news. And so our three founders founded the company to do just that, tell people what's happening, but also give them the skills and tools to actually fix it. And so that's literally where my job sits within the company. I'm the person that kind of bridges the things that we talk about on our, through our different um, content and find tangible ways for our audience to get involved and take action. So for me, I think I would define civic engagement as kind of exactly what I'm doing, equipping people with the knowledge, skills, and guidance to be engaged citizens who are capable of creating change um, through our democratic process. 
Uh, love all that. So Scott, with, with Generation Citizen, huge thanks to all of you for joining, um, especially for, for Jyoti. This was her uh, original um, idea to put this panel together. Um, and so, uh, so excited that we can, that we can make this happen um, uh, and, and are able to get more folks uh, from around the country than we would have if we were in, in Austin. So um, really great to, to be with you all from my apartment in, in Brooklyn. And um, I just say on, on that, I mean, I, I think echoing what, what the panelists said, Generation Citizen is, is all about engaging young people to be active citizens in the process. And I guess I'd start with, um, I think it's important that we understand um, what we mean by actually engaging in our democracy or political process. And for us, I mean, democracy is really a, a process. Um, it is a process in which people come to the table to make collective decisions. Um, not a set of outcomes, but it's 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 how are people actually participating in that process? And so I think civics education is a way of inviting people into that process um, and ensuring that they can be part of that process. Um, I think the knowledge is important. The the whole question that we had was explicitly about that knowledge, but it's so much more than that. Um, as Shinika was saying, it's it's the it's the skills, um, it's it's the dispositions, it's the invitation from from government to actually be part of the process too. Um, and so I think it is that all comprehensive vantage point into into what it is actually how how do we ensure that that people actually have the guidance and knowledge uh, skill sets and values to participate in our democracy um and we'll say just i, I do think it's this is a particularly apt time to be talking about this topic because uh, of how uh, readily a, a, a parent it is how much government matters right now um and i think in order for government to work as well as we can we need citizen engagement and civic education is a crucial part of ensuring that that engagement can happen. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And, and thanks for that, Scott. I mean, you know, how do we uh, ensure that everybody is expressing their voice? Uh, how do we make it cool uh, to be civically engaged? You, you know, get up in the morning, you brush your teeth and you do something that involves, you know, your community. Um, so I'm just curious if, if perhaps Scott, you can give us a, just a quick, um, thought on why you think that civics education has actually waned to begin with. Like, why are we just a quick, like, you know, thought on like, why you think that we're in a crisis? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a great question and I don't, I definitely don't have all the answers, but I have some thoughts and I think, you know, I will say as I said, GC comes at this from the vantage point of civics education amongst young people, but I think this is, it's more encompassing than just young people in our education system. And so look forward to what the panel said. But I mean, our education system has system, systemically and systematically deprioritized civics education for generations. Um, you know, as you talked about at the beginning, schools used to prioritize this, students used to get multiple semesters of this, now they're lucky if they get one. Um, a whole host of reasons for this. I think one, oftentimes, um, you know, in the civics education, field we refer to, you know, when, when, Sputnik, when, when Sputnik was launched, um, you know, that, that was the moment where we as a country started to, to really focus on, on STEM and science and technology, engineering, math, all incredibly important subjects, but potentially at the, uh, at the, at the uh, contrast actually prioritizing civics education. I, I think that sometimes um, we've uh, assumed that sort of our democracy and government will continue to function as is without recognizing that um, we need to constantly reimagine and, and, and re revive it and, and never take it for granted, which is, is something that I think uh, a lot more folks are thinking about now. Again, from an education perspective, I think that there's a huge push on accountability, um, which means that, that things like civics education just weren't seen as, as vital to um, you know, creating um, folks that, that, that were more employable. Um, I think that the, the skills that, that civics education evokes are incredibly important for, for any job that you have as well, but I don't think that that's been seen throughout society. Um, and so, you know, the federal government has deprioritized funding for it. States have deprioritized assessments for it. It's a little, it's a little harder to assess um, than something like math or science. So if I ask you what an effective citizen is, um, if we put that as a poll, we might get a whole host of different answers, which means it's difficult to assess, which means it's difficult to prioritize. Um, you know, I will say that, you know, in the, in, and we're nonpartisan, but in the wake of the 2016 election, I think there's a lot more appetite for, you know, oh, civics education is more important than it's ever been. I, I don't think it's, it's necessarily more important than it's ever been. I think it's always incredibly important. I think the ramifications of not prioritizing for civics education, of not having an education system that places democracy at the front and center of it, um, that's, that's more readily apparent, readily apparent after the election. It's, it's incredibly apparent 
um, in the moment that we have right now. Um, but but yeah, I think that those are those are just a few reasons that um, that, that 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 civics education has been deprioritized for for so long. Oh, for sure. Oh, you know, this is a great time to actually share the polling results because it seems at the baseline we should be able to understand who our three branches of government are and how they interact with each other. Um, our own president occasionally seems to have, you know, issues with that. Uh, and hopefully that doesn't sound partisan. I it just is a fact. Um, so most of you picked 25% and that is correct. Um, basically one in four adults can cite all three branches of government. Another way to look at this is most of the country really isn't sure. And I think that definitely plays into um, notions of, you know, when different uh, entities are, are, you know, arguing with each other, I don't think the average, it, it's clear the average citizen doesn't understand uh, what their role is. Um, and therefore, how can they interact with government, right? Um, okay, so let's launch another poll just, and then we're gonna, and that is, uh, again, this is all to the idea of, you know, how much people really understand, um, you know. Anyway, the question is, what percentage of adults think Ju Judge Judy is on the Supreme Court on the SCOTUS? So, um, there's your choices, 20%, 10%, 5%, and 50%, and we will go ahead and, um, you know, um, like, Go ahead and respond to the poll. And then the next question I was gonna ask of our panel is, and, and maybe Brianna, you could um, take the lead on this. Could you, how do you think civic education and or literacy really plays out when it applies to communities of color? So I grimaced when you asked that question a little while ago about Judge Judy, but really uh, Voto Latino, our main purpose as you know, exemplified by our name is registering the Latinx community to vote, educating them on issues around voting and in their community, and then mobilizing them to show up on election day, uh, whether that's in person or casting a ballot. So really civic education comes into play for all of those things. You have to understand the process, you know, how to politically how to um, engage in your democracy, when elections are coming up, what dates there are, um, joining and feeling like you're part of a community that your vote matters, your voice matters, um, representatives are accountable to you, and actually being able to carry that through on election day, being educated about the issues and feeling confident in your vote and your choice. So we see a huge lack of engagement in the Latinx community for different reasons. You have um, barriers that have gone on for decades and for generations where you have the need to register voters in advance, um, where other countries, they have it um, automatic. So that's been a huge barrier to communities of color. I was looking up some research a while ago and there were about 87,000 individuals from Georgia who were disenfranchised in 2018, uh, communities of color, both black and brown, because they registered to vote after the deadline. Um, so I know some folks are from Texas, your deadline to register to vote is 30 days in advance of the election. So just having that barrier keeps um, communities of color from actually having their voice heard, exercising their right to vote. And then other things that we're seeing. So our team did a poll back in 2019 with our audience and our network, and we saw that less than half were actually reached out to by political candidates. So these individuals were never courted for their vote. Um, a lot of candidates and uh, campaigns believe that the Latinx community doesn't vote. They've been called the sleeping giant since, uh, you know, early 2000s with Bush campaigns. So we're seeing that a lot of Latinx voters, even though they tally 32 million strong, um, which means the difference between winning and losing campaigns, are not courted for their vote because campaigns don't think that they'll be turned out. So that's a dilemma. Our voters are not being educated. They are a little bit shaky on how the political process works, everything from registering to vote to turning out on election day. And the system really is set up to keep them from voting. There are different barriers that come up all the time. Thanks, Brianna. I mean, you know, so this is great. So we, we've set like the problem a bit, right? So I wanted to now turn it over to Shaniqua as we start to think about how we might reimagine um, 
you know, actually bringing our, our population into better civic literacy. Um, and, you know, maybe we can talk a little bit about Vote Saif America and I mean, the reason why um, Cricket Media decided to launch this platform. Yeah, um, I think the very first thing we have to do is, um, you know, meet people where they are. That is what we talk about at Crooked Media all the time. We don't try to, you know, people already are not, voting's not fun. It's important, but it's not the most fun thing in the you world. You just rock so. the vote, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no offense to rock the vote. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, we don't try to tell people voting is fun. Um, we don't try to tell them engaging in the process is fun because it's hard. Uh, and people have consolidated power and in order to break that up and hold people accountable, it is really hard. But we tell people the truth and then we meet them where they are. So, you know, a lot of young people for Caribbean media, most of our audience, they're millennials and millennials aren't, you know, all the youngest people anymore, uh, but that's who our audience is. And we know that a lot of millennials are online. So all of our content is online. The only thing I guess you could consider offline that we do are tour stops. Uh, and we are definitely not doing those now. So right now, everything that we do is online. And when we create content, we know that most people are consuming, or a lot of young people are consuming it on their phones. So, you know, we factor that in highly. And when, for instance, Votes of America, when we created that, Last year, it wasn't as mobile friendly as we would like it to be. And this year, um, we have a new site. It's really nice if you want to go to votesaveamerica.com. Um, but now it, it looks great on the phone. You don't have to, um, you know, we had this uh, interactive map last year where you could click on your state. That didn't necessarily make sense if someone was on their phone. You can't see all 50 states, um, not easily. And then you have to, if you live like in Rhode Island, you have to like, go in and make it big and click on it. So again, meeting people where they are on the devices that they're using. Um, and so I think two really good examples of that, one, our Vote Save America, uh, but also Snapchat. We have, I don't have Snapchat, so I am sharing this with you from uh, stories from my team that runs this, but we run our shows on Snapchat. So they're like, you can watch TV shows on Snapchat and our podcasts are on Snapchat as, as television shows as well. I guess they're not television shows, but shows that people can watch. Uh, and they do really well amongst younger um, younger ages. So I think a little like, younger than uh, millennials. Um, so younger millennials and Gen Z, but we also include in there calls to action. Um, you can, we were able to integrate uh, vote.org's registration tool in there. So we are meeting these young people on Snapchat um, for whatever reason, they like our content there, and then we're encouraging them to register to vote right within the app. And so that's just another way, again, you know, not expecting them to go find a voter registration form and then fill it out and then mail it after they find a stamp and then put it in the mail. Um, we're just expecting them to kind of be where they are and we meet them there. And the last thing I'd add about Vote Save America, so many of the kind of voter registration and electoral campaigns that are out there focus a lot on voter registration, which is, of course, important. It's the first step to participating in the process, but they don't often tell you everything else, which is also um, kind of a, a, a hindrance that keeps people from voting. So literally, how do you vote? I know I need to register to vote, but like, where do I get my, where do I register? And then after I register, well, um, you know, is there a deadline for that? Can I vote by mail? If I do vote by mail, like, how do I even do that? Uh, can I vote anywhere in the state? Can I vote anywhere in my county? A lot of those questions don't always get answered. So on Vote Save America, we break down a lot of those questions uh, that people may be a little bit embarrassed to ask about uh, and give them information that they need. Um, but I, you know, this isn't the case for crooked media, but just generally, I think we have to also make sure we're not assuming that everyone is in the same place. Not everyone has access to um, the digital spaces, even, you know, that crooked media creates. So as the larger universe of people engaged in this work or doing this work, and we continue to move further and further into the digital age, um, we'll have to make sure we're not making ex assumptions about um, everyone being able to show up there and uh, finding ways that we can engage people from, again, where they are. Um, and this is, I'm okay. sorry to interrupt, but actually this is a great um, segue point in the yeah. sense that meeting people where they are. So, you know, you, you, first you say the word civic education, it kind of sounds, you know, like education, right? But I think you just bring up such an important point, um, especially in 
the age we're living through where we're literally not even interacting with each other in person. So throw a little COVID spin on this. And I, if you don't mind, Shanique, what I was thinking okay. is we could bring the other panelists into this discussion of how can we meet, especially low propensity voting communities, youth, Latinx, immigrants, you know, if we want, if we feel like a healthy democracy is one that involves everybody, let's assume that we agree on that, um, then how do we meet um, those folks where they are? Maybe we can, I mean, I don't know, Bri Brianna or Scott, maybe you could chime in a little bit on some of the things that Shanique has been talking about. Yeah, happy to, happy to start and then, and then turn it over to Brianna, but I think it's a super important point. And I think when it goes to something Shanique was said in terms of, I, I think oftentimes you find with our young people too, um, I think two things. One, especially with a lot of the young people that we work with, they've essentially been systematically told through the public systems that they participate in that their voices don't matter. Um, and I think you're seeing that very much in this moment right now where there's so many populations, the most vulnerable populations that, um, that, that, um, that are being affected disproportionately by both COVID-19 and the response to COVID-19. The second thing is, I think oftentimes when we tell people to participate, to vote, to participate in our democracy, it's a little bit like eat your broccoli. It's a little bit like do this because it's an important civic thing to do that's incredibly important. And I think there's such an opportunity, um, and we think about this in terms of our, our action civics content, um, some might call it lived civics for young people especially, but, but for people in general, to see how the experience that they, that the experiences that they're having on a daily basis are part and parcel to what it means to have effective civic knowledge, not just the stats that we threw up, but, but just understanding um, what it means to, um, to, to, to not receive adequate representation from public institutions. Um, you know, the young people that, that we work with have acute knowledge of what it means to, to have police brutality in their communities. And we need that knowledge at the table to actually address those issues too. And so what we literally do in our civics program is that young people choose local issues they care about and then take some sort of real action. And so it is sort of the meeting them where they're at because civics becomes something that's relevant to their own lives, not something that's this sort of like esoteric, ephemeral, like participate in it because it's a good thing to do, but rather because it can be incredibly relevant. Now, if you think about an education system, I think this is something that we could build in a post-COVID moment that really places democracy front and center, everything can be seen from that angle. Um, you know, how are we, um, you know, uh, science class becomes uh, about how we're understanding the, the, the spread of this or how we're understanding um, the, the reaction to it. Math class becomes about understanding the economic response. Um, I, I think that there's, there's English class becomes about understanding the different types of information that have been put out there and how to actually uh, decipher journalism in this moment in time too. So I think there's so many possibilities right now to really put democracy front and center of our education system and making civics more relevant um, than, than it's ever been before. Uh, Jyoti, I wonder if I could elevate a question from the chat that relates to this. Sure. Uh, there's a question coming in from uh, Brian, uh, which I think is really interesting, um, talking about if you're oh, yeah. all made superintendent of a school district um, and had magical powers where you could do whatever you wanted, what would you want to change to the schools to address the civic engagement crisis? Oh, boy. That sounds fun. I would love to have a superpower. <laughs> um, but I think, Brian, um, what we really see is that civic engagement education is really dependent on the schools, the states that you're in. So superintendent actually would have a lot of power and I think the ability to create or at least help shape or support teachers who are trying to mold a curriculum. I think I'll give a shout out to Generation Citizen. I know you all have some really awesome resources for you know students and for the K through 12 community. But with that in mind, just realizing that um, civic education is not standard across the country. And really, when we talk about it or when we teach it, it's really in these terms like definitions, very, very um, scholastic, just talking about what it is, but not necessarily creating a context of what it should look like in your community. We can talk about reaching out to our representatives. And, you know, I was having a conversation with our team at Voto Latino earlier today because we're um, 
doing some advocacy work around vote by mail and election protections coming out of the challenges that we saw in Wisconsin where you know, people had to go vote in person during this crisis and we're seeing 52 cases of coronavirus just stemming from that as of today. Um, but realizing that we need to have the ability to contextualize it, share what this information is and then how it's impactful. So when our team is talking about, you know, advocating around vote by mail, it's taking that knowledge of, you know, there are 100 US senators and then putting it into practice, identifying there are senators who are up for election in 2020 who might be more or less, um, we can press upon them to support a bill that would be effective and helpful to everyone to make sure that people don't have to go out and vote and risk their lives just to exercise their voice. So that's really, you know, something that I would bring to the forefront if I had the superpower of being an educator. And then also Larry um, from the chat, Larry Schooler has mentioned that, you know, the idea, I, I'm gonna rephrase it as do, learn, do. The idea of giving students opportunity to affect what's happening in their own schools and districts. And I think that teaches um, the sort of responsibility of the individual versus the system. Um, and that's what uh, experiential learning. I think that's um, what, so I just wanted to lift that up from the commentary because I think that's an excellent point. Of course, you know, um, you know, for those of you who are educators, I think it's, it's really a question of how one incorporates that into the curriculum. What I, what I think we have here with this panel um, is, you know, basically nonprofit organization or you know, organizations who have taken it upon themselves to sort of fill in um, the deficiencies that we have. And so, you know, whether it's Foto Latino addressing their specific community or, you know, um, Vote Save America kind of addressing maybe a, more, a broader community, but trying to meet people where they are and to kind of go back and fill in those gaps. Um, it's super, you know, we can't wait for the curriculum to change and for the, the civic habits to be formed and you know we have to sort of I think meet both at both places but um, what I'd love to do is just really quickly um, share the results of the poll and then move on to sort of a little bit more of potential solutions with this panel so um, the thing and the question I said it wrong was actually how many college graduates think Judge Judy is on the Supreme Court which I think is um, a little bit more key and most of you pick 20% um, and, and luckily that's not true, it's actually only 10%, but still, it's, uh, it was, a, I thought, a surprising statistic. So anyway, thanks for playing with that uh, and engaging in our poll. Um, so next question, and this is a little bit more now about like sort of looking to the future. What are other potential solutions? Um, you know, like think 21st century solutions. Here we are, we're having, you know, a, we're having a panel that we would have all had in person. Um, what else, can technology play a role? Uh, what, are there any successful practices from other countries? Um, for those of you who have ideas to share, you know, whether it's, this is for either of you, you know, Brianna, Scott, Shaniqua, whoever wants to respond. Or did I stump you? <laughs> uh, I'll start quickly, I mean, I think I, I would, I would, offer both you know structural reforms and then um things that are creatively on the individual level too i think that there's a lot of structural things I, I saw someone up here put a question about automatic voter registration i think that makes a lot of sense you're seeing a lot of studies come out right now about um voting by mail um which there was just a study that was featured in the new york times yesterday about how colorado saw higher rates of participation across the board especially amongst young people um with voting by mail so i think that that stuff matters we at at GC push lowering the voting age to, to 16, um, especially in local elections, which gives young people an opportunity to participate um, when they're younger in age and incentivize the schools to teach civics education. We coming out of this moment are gonna need a comprehensive, um, you know, pro-democracy agenda. How are we rebuilding our civic fabric? And so I think all of these ideas are gonna have to be put on the table um, in terms of thinking about how to, um, you know, how to actually build forward. And then I think, you know, from the ground up, it's, it's what some other folks have been talking about in terms of, um, you know, how do we, um, how do we really motivate individuals to care about this? How can individuals see um, that, that they're participating? I think that there's innovative ways that technology might play a role in people seeing that they could participate in local council. 
I know that, that, that that's something that folks have been thinking about. I think that there's innovative ways to think about civics education that to connect people together. We're trying to do that with young people. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that there is going to be a, a need to be a, there's going to be a, a reimagining what our civic space looks like. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be curious what that actually looks like. And I think for us, it is interesting and young people, a generation that's going to be just go into an economy that is historically terrible um, to give them the keys to help reimagine our democracy too. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I think one of the things we probably should touch on, um, and, and it was a question from Leo actually, what justification is typically used for why automatic re voter registration is a bad idea. Um, there is a very real thing uh, called voter suppression. And, um, you know, you may not, you may or may not live in a community that experiences it, but I can guarantee you one of the things that um, we got to do in, in the documentary that I worked on is uh, we actually covered uh, Georgia um, and, and the Stacey Abrams campaign and in intimate detail and really got to see it up front. And I must admit it was rather shocking, um, the sort of small, nuanced, pernicious ways that um, voter suppression takes place. And um, it's everything from, you know, ex you know, shortening the, 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 poll, the poll hours to, you know, um, kicking people off for very minute issues with their names. Um, but I mean, maybe I think that there's an issue there, just if anybody else wants to comment on why they think automatic voter registration or making voting day a, a holiday hasn't come to pass. I mean, um, I can't pull off the top of my head what politicians say in defense of not doing that, but um, does anybody have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so again, sitting in Texas, right, um, and our team works in a lot of states where you have large Latinx communities who tend to be kicked off of the polls because, you know, you might have two last names and your ID doesn't match your signature. So very minute things, um, but really the reason uh, that a lot of elected officials argue to register to vote is to prevent voter fraud when actually a lot of studies that we've seen, there are very slim cases of voter fraud compared to the number of people who are actually disenfranchised by these very, very dracon draconian rules. Sure, um, that's great. Yeah, thanks for lifting that up. Um, is there any, Shaniqua, Brianna, do you wanna comment at all about the other question that I asked, which is really a little bit more about how we, how we actually move in to imagining a better uh, system for, um, you know, educating not only young people, but also adults? Yeah, I think we have to make it part of our culture. Um, you know, two of my uh, coworkers are from Minnesota and they often talk about how high voter participation is in Minnesota. And I was reading a few articles last night and one thing that kept coming up on these lists of things um, for why voter participation is so high in Minnesota is that it's immeasurable, but there's just this sense of civic duty uh, and everyone feels a sense of pride in, in voting. And I think one way that we can do that is by starting early and instilling in children that you know, voting is, again, maybe we can make it fun, but it's something that's really important to do. You know, a lot of kids don't like going to school, but they know they're supposed to because it's gonna have a positive impact on their future. So I think if we can start, um, and Scott mentioned this before, start to bridge, um, you know, the our democratic process with people's everyday lives, they will start to see that, oh, you know, this can have an impact in my life. And I think local government is probably the best way to do that. Our country is very obsessed with national politics, but local government, you know, one, if there's a pothole outside, your local government is, is who can fix that. And you can see the direct um, relationship between the problems immediately in front of you and who can fix that. You can also run into your local representative in the grocery store. You can, you know, in the way that it's hard to just go up to DC um, or to have immediate access to your elected representatives, you can do that. You can go to the mayor's office, you can go to the city council meetings and you um, can see these people and. You know, one thing that's been floating around in my head, I'm not an educator, I'm not sure exactly how this would work, but to me it would be very um, interesting if we could tie current events into, um, you know, what kids are learning every day. I often think back to when I got to college, I was 18, Hurricane Katrina had happened on like my first week of school, and it was the first time I started to understand that 
the government was responsible in a way for what was happening down there. And I, I just couldn't understand how there were people in power who would let you know, things happen and then not respond in the appropriate way. So I think if current events could kind of be tied to, um, you know, who's in office in a better way as we're educating kids about current events, um, you know, George Bush was, George W. Bush was president from the time I was 10 to 18. So, or might need to shift that age range, but for a, a long part of my life. And I didn't know there were any issues with him until I was an adult. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a good point. And, and, you know, by the way, if anybody out in the um, audience also has um, ideas that they'd like to, hear, please, you know, drop it into chat. But I think that the idea of, sort of civic culture shift. So again, when you talk about civic education, it sounds like, oh, that's something I should do. Um, you know, something you want to do is make your life better, make your neighbor's life better, make your community better, right? So how, how do we link that and how do we link um, the perception of that as a culture shift, as you said, Shaniqua? Um, any thought, I mean, let me ask you, Brianna, how, how is Voto Latino kind of getting with the Latinx community? There's so many challenges. Are there any interesting ways that you've used to kind of engage people, draw them out into the activities that you want them to participate in? Yeah, so I might be an idealist who thinks civic engagement is fun, but really a perspective that we have at Bota Latino is that, you know, this, this whole world like of political engagement is really exciting and being able to take ownership of it and have your voice heard and represent your family and be there for them and make sure that you're advocating for your community because we've been disenfranchised for so long. So really approaching it as an opportunity, almost inviting people into a party, right? Um, so what I really love about Voto Latino is our social media. So if you're not following us, give us a follow at Voto Latino. But I am a big fan of our social media team's work because they've done such an incredible job of taking these, you know, huge lofty ideas that don't necessarily sound interesting on paper, but putting them into context in a way that is manage manageable, in a way that you can digest it and understand. So an example of that was before the Iowa primary, our team in DC, they filmed a video about a taco primary. So people were in the office, advocating for tacos, saying like, I like carne asada, I like this type of taco, and really using that as a way to explain how the Iowa primaries were being carried out. How in Iowa, when you primary, you basically gather with all your friends and rally around um, and advocate for your uh, candidate. And we just use tacos as a fun cultural way to talk about how much we love carne asada or how much we love a different type of taco. So we did that. Um, Shifting away from voting, our team did a video on um, census. So talking about washing your hands, something you can also do at home is take the census. We went out to a taco truck in California and there's this guy out there who's an immigrant. His family is originally from DF and other parts of Mexico. And he was saying how he uses just this very um, common theme where you're driving by, you go stop at a taco truck for lunch, that moment of engagement to talk to people who trust you in your community. There is an open door there and to advocate for taking the census, sharing how, you know, you're here to just pick up a taco, but have you thought about taking the census? Like I see you all the time, really using those peer to peer relationships to invite people in to take part in their democracy. Our team is also doing some digital organizing so we can't hang out in person and do text banks at, you know, pizza spots and invite everyone and gather together but we're doing a lot of online engagement. So bringing people on our Slack channel, making it fun where you as an individual can take a meaningful action in your community, text people, ensure that they're registered to vote, ensure that they took the census, and also just keep them engaged as someone who cares. Um, in the Latinx community, we see that even though people cite feeling disempowered as a main reason for not getting involved, those peer-to-peer -peer relationships are incredibly meaningful. So we're really trying to, you know, extend an arm, extend a hand, and invite people to take part in their democracy and participate with us. 
You know, I, it occurs to me as I was listening to you that um, there's other organizations, especially in the 2018 um, cycle that uh, engaged in this program called Party to the Polls. And while that sounds, you know, maybe a little uh, derivative, it actually was the idea that there's a celebration, you go as a group and that you vote. And um, as I understand, the program was also, you know, making sure that people understood the steps that they need to take in order to prepare for the party. Um, so I think what I'm hearing is a, a couple of ways to just kind of meld important, um, you know, sort of civic activity with, you know, sort of social activity. Um, and it does take a bit of, you know, art, to make that happen, right? To make that actually enjoyable and people get it and, and to translate a taco uh, metaphor to, you know, caucusing. So um, kudos to you for trying that out. Um, let me see if there's, any, oh, you know what, Scott? Did you, did you have any examples from, it's always good to look at other countries if, if, if that's something. Yeah, that I mean, a few things I'll say on that and, and appreciate all those examples. I, I think, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time growing up abroad when I was when I was a kid. I, I think, especially in this moment, and we're we're seeing this, we're sort of this this antiquated notion that America has an exceptional democracy. I, I just think that that's been you know totally bashed to the wayside right now. Um, and I think there's a lot that we can learn from other countries in terms of um, you know how they they promoted um, participation as as well. Um, and one thing that you've seen, it's 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 it mostly started in Brazil actually, and is picking up a lot of steam here is participatory budgeting. Um, and having citizens actually participate in a local level um, to set their own their own budgets. Um, it happens in New York City all the time. Um, I think that that's something that's um, uh, that, that, that's really exciting um, and, and spreading to other places. Um, a few other examples, um, Ireland has is, is put something together called a Citizens Assembly. Um, they had 99 randomly selected Irish citizens that represented a sample of the general public that spent 10 weekends over a year together deliberating five issues. Um, which are selected by Parliament, so climate change, the challenges of the Asian population, um, and um, they learn from experts, they discuss in groups, and they made recommendations for a course of action by the government. It's sort of an innovative citizens' assembly that um, you know I think is, is something that we could we could learn from here to actually get um, people involved in um, uh, you know in, in, in huge decisions. Um, Madrid has something called the Cide Madrid, um, which is a civic participation program and online platform. Um, and they online have proposals and votes for new local laws, they have debates, they have consultations, um, and there are a few major infrastructure projects designed um, by citizens that have actually been turned into policy. Um, so I think that, that like actually using these is, especially in this moment, um, you know, what are ways that, that different countries are ensuring that people are actually participating? Um, there's something really exciting about that too. Uh, and, uh, you know, one thing I wanted to just add, uh, you know, Shanique, well, you can maybe speak to this. One of the things that your, your, uh, your bosses do is actually use humor, right? To underscore what is working and what is not working in our political process. And uh, along the way, as you listen to a podcast, you learn something. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that that is what brought so many people kind of into the fold, if you will. Um, a lot of the things that happen in our political system can sometimes feel very heavy. It feels like there's a lot of arguing and, um, oh, sorry, if that's my computer, um, a lot of arguing and just like nothing's, nothing is happening, but they are able to bring some levity to really ser serious situations. Um, you know, if you want to listen, by all means. Um, but last week, uh, on Thursday, I think, no, 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 it was last week on Monday, uh, they were just kind of, um, thinking through who our VP options could be, or Joe Biden's VP options could be. And then they just went down this rabbit hole of what if um, Hillary Clinton had won, and uh, I'm gonna mess it up. But anyway, they went down this rabbit hole and you could see like what it means to pick a VP and the impact that it has on everything, especially since Joe Biden has kind of signaled that he's going to serve for one term if elected, and then allow his VP to, to be president. So, you know, I think given their experiences working within government and seeing 
you know, the really good sides, but also a lot of the crazy sides, um, they're able to bring that humor in. I always, you know, I spent six years working in government and so many people ask me, oh, is it like House of Cards? And it's really more like Veep. And I think when you have people who um, are, you know, kind of in there and see what's happening behind the scenes, they can bring, um, bring some, some laughter into it. That's cool. Hey, um, I'm sorry, can I just ask, Ida, you said that we're going to yeah. create a poll based on the chat. Yeah, I did. Thanks, Jodi. I was actually looking at the chat and noticed that there's some folks that are having a discussion on um, on the main level uh, lever of change um, uh, for civics education. So we'd just love to open it up to this group and we'll launch a poll in just a second uh, just to encourage everybody around the conversation. And we'll do that in a second. Yeah, thank you so much. And and I think we just have a couple of minutes and then um, what we would encourage you, oh, here we are. What do you see as the main lever of change for civics education? Is it the state level, district level, schools, teachers? I might add also, I don't know, it's sort of indefinable. Somebody mentioned that art is sort of the glue, but let's, let's all take the poll. And um, ooh, this is a tough one, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what the answer is. Um, is there anyone who has uh, one last question and then we're gonna give you the opportunity to continue the discussion um, in the breakout rooms, which will follow? I'm just looking here to see. You know, one thing I will just comment on is it, 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 it really feels like um, each, group. So Scott is, you know, when I was thinking about putting this panel together, like Scott's definitely working from a, you know, reinventing um, education within the education system. Um, you know, Shaniqua, you're working in an organization that is actually sort of using, um, I would say, media, cultural media to kind of reinforce, you know, political and civic literacy. And then Brianna, you, you've got sort of a combination where your organization also works sort of directly with your community, right? So there's, there's um, sort of spreading the word out generally through media, whether it's could be, you know, there's a TV show on right now on Hulu called Mrs. America, which actually, uh, you know, captures sort of the, the um, details of the, you know, uh, the women's rights movement that may, maybe some people don't know, you know, and so that's, but it's a show with famous, you know, really well cast people so that, you know, you're also watching as, as entertainment, um, you know, and then, but you can't just use entertainment to replace what Scott has been doing, which is sort of reinventing how kids are actually engaging with the system. And so maybe, I'm just going to posit this that maybe it's it's all of these different forces culture education um you know sort of political organizing all of that those forces working together to ensure that we're lifting people up bringing them into the system and um you know uh, giving them a reason to really stick with it the more that people engage the more they continue to re-engage right i mean would you agree with that at any, at any rate And uh, Jyoti, I, I noticed one question from um, Kaz. I'm, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Um, it, it says, how do you foster skills around supporting people to develop a vision of the future they want so that they can see a reason to get engaged and participate? One thing I'll, I'll say on that that I think speaks to Jyoti's point a little bit too that I've been thinking a lot about is um, I think we're going to enter an age of um, I don't think, I, I don't mean this from a partisan perspective, but just um, robust government intervention. I mean, that, that just, um, I think that there's a lot more appetite for universal programs. There's a lot more appetite for governmental spending. And at the same time, um, you have incredibly low levels of trust in government. So holding those truths at the, at the same time is something that's very interesting because you're saying we need government more than ever and people trust government less than they ever have. Um, and this wasn't true during the, the Great Depression. Um, people actually had a great deal of trust in government to do the right thing. And so I think that sort of goes to the question of, we need people to be engaged and participate right now, but they don't trust government. And I, I guess I'd say from, from the generation citizen angle, one thing that um, it, it's, 
you know, as frustrated you are with government, the more broken that politics is, the more important it is to participate. Um, and that can be a very frustrating thing to hear sometimes from folks that have been jaded by the system um, and, and from a system that is so often, as was talked about, that was talked about explicitly excluded voices from the table throughout our history. Um, but I do think that that's gonna be something that we need to reckon with in the years to come, um, is that very question from Cass, how do you get people to participate? But this notion of we need more government and we don't trust government, um, I think is going to be something that, that we'll continue to reckon with. And maybe if people participate more, they will have a direct knowledge and maybe they will trust more. I'm not saying that's necessarily the case, but that's an idea. Listen, we're, um, we're at the two o'clock, or excuse me for me, I'm West Coast. We're at the either five o'clock or the two o'clock mark, depending on where you are. Um, I really thank all of you. I mean, I just think this is such an amazing panel. Um, I'm so honored um, to be amid you and I'm so grateful for the work that you all are doing um, within your communities. It's really important. Um, I will share the poll results as well. Um, so uh, it looks like people had a tough time deciding, but district level uh, edged out state and school level for the main lover of change. So take that with you into the breakout rooms if you want to discuss that further. Um, just from my end, I just wanted to um, do a shout out for, and she could be next, look for it on, on PBS on June 29th and 30th. And just thank you guys, continue to stay engaged, continue to stay involved. Um, and hopefully some of you will join us into the breakout rooms. Actually, let me now transition this to Ida. Will you tell us how